Today's sermon text is Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. If you're using a pew Bible, that can be found on page 845. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Amen. Good morning. Let's pray again together. Father, we pray now for grace to receive your word with faith. We pray that by your spirit, you would be conforming us as your people more and more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, that we would serve in the strength that you supply so that you would be glorified. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. One of the conversation topics uh, that will be coming around again and again as long as people are still having conversations is the question uh, that's raised in our text this morning, who is the greatest? And for whatever reason, sports fans especially love to argue about this question with particular interest and passion and general lack of objectivity. It's never enough to just say someone is a great player. You have to know, is he actually the greatest? Many of you know the World Cup starts today. This is a month-long soccer tournament with 32 nations uh, from around the world, and, and it will certainly add fuel to the argument over who is the greatest player in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo from Portugal, or Leo Messi from Argentina. Some of you guys are sitting up straighter in your chairs right now because you have an opinion about that question. You bring it a little bit closer to home, the, the discussion over the greatest NFL quarterback has been a little bit boring lately because Tom Brady has just set himself apart so much uh, from everybody else. But it, when it comes to basketball... The conversation gets a little bit more lively. LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. Of course, any, any reasonably sane person knows Jordan is the, is the greatest. The fact that I grew up near Chicago in the Jordan era it has nothing to do with that. Maybe you don't care about sports. You've got stronger opinions about the greatest American president or the greatest composer, or novelist, or poet, or Hollywood actor, whatever it may be. Of course, in, in all of those discussions, what's the key issue? The key issue is, how do you define greatness? And that's precisely what makes those discussions so interesting, because in many cases, right, people, they're not operating with the same definition 
of what makes a person great. If we go back to the sports analogy, is, is it merely points scored or is it the overall balance of their performance? Is it, is it the best individual performance or is it the one who makes their team the most successful? You might value a certain skill or a certain trait higher than another person does. And of course, that's what makes coming to an agreement about those discussions so difficult. We, we realize there's a more fundamental question that lies underneath. What defines greatness? And in our text this morning, Jesus enters that conversation with his disciples and he reorients the discussion. He redefines greatness according to God's perspective. And in doing so, he makes clear it looks very different from what the world often thinks of greatness. According to Jesus, greatness is defined by service. And the greatest honor is to be given and will be given to the one who makes himself the servant of all. So as we think about greatness and honor from Jesus' perspective this morning, consider with me these three things. First, the service of Christ himself. The service of Christ himself. Secondly, the service of Christ's disciples. The service of Christ's disciples. And then thirdly, the service of those who are weak. The service of those who are weak. So first, the service of Christ himself. Our text begins this morning with Jesus uh, speaking again about his coming suffering and his death and his resurrection from the dead. In verse 30, we see evidence of Jesus' determination to go to Jerusalem in order to accomplish what he speaks about in verse 31. Up until this point, Mark has presented Jesus' ministry as taking place largely in and around the region of Galilee in the north of Israel. Most recently, Jesus and his disciples have gone even further north than that, up around the the area of Caesarea Philippi. But now Mark tells us, that Jesus passed through Galilee. So he's clearly moving south, coming from the north of Galilee, passing through Galilee. And Mark tells us he didn't want anyone to know that he was there. What's going on with that? The idea seems to be Jesus did not want to be detained with ministering to people in the region of Galilee as he's been been doing for some time because the time had now come for him to go to Jerusalem. It's interesting. This is actually the last time Galilee is mentioned in the book of Mark until after the resurrection. So, so Jesus is traveling with very clear purpose. And in verse 31, he speaks of that purpose. So again, it's the second time in Mark's gospel where, where Jesus very clearly and concisely declares this is what's going to happen. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Now, what the disciples still don't understand is that Jesus was describing the way that he was going to serve them. Not just them, but serve the entire world. This this was the way that Jesus himself would become the last of all and the servant of all. He would be delivered into the hands of men and they would kill him. That phrase, delivered into the hands of men, it carries more significance than it might seem at first. I wonder as you read that phrase, if you envisioned in your mind, who's delivering Jesus over into the hands of men? Maybe if you know the rest of the story, you thought of Judas, or you thought of the Jewish leaders, or you thought of Pilate. And to some degree, all of those would be true. Judas delivered Jesus over to the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders delivered Jesus over to Pilate. 
Pilate delivered Jesus over to Roman soldiers to be crucified. Mark actually uses this same language to describe all of those things of Jesus being delivered over. But, but we can't just stop there. We actually have to go deeper with that. And I do think Mark intends us to see this here because the Scripture is equally clear that it was ultimately God who delivered Jesus over into the hands of men. Listen to Acts 2.23. Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So God is the one who delivered over Jesus to be killed by the hands of men. And, and the implications of that are dramatic because that means Jesus was not just going to suffer and die as sort of a tragic accident that was a detour away from God's plan of salvation. That means Jesus and Jesus' suffering and death were essential to that plan that God himself was carrying out. There's even more that we can say about that. Because if that's true, then Jesus is not simply going to be betrayed from one man to another, but rather Jesus is being delivered out of God's hands into the hands of his enemies. This is a way of speaking to, to, to make that clear. If you know your Old Testament, you know that one of the primary ways that God expressed his wrath against his rebellious people was that he handed them over to their enemies. Read your Old Testament again and again. This is how God delivers punishment upon his people. He delivers them into the hands of wicked men. He delivers them into the hands of enemy nations. You see this in the time of the judges. You see this in the exile of Israel and of Judah. Do you remember when King David took a census of the people? Pridefully, he numbered the people and he falls under God's judgment. And what does God do? God actually gives him a choice for how he's going to experience that judgment. And here were the choices. Three years of famine, three months of being subject to his enemies, or three days of pestilence. Do you remember what David said? This, this was his answer. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord. For his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. To be delivered out of God's hands and into the hands of men was a terrible expression of God's wrath. So why would God do that to Jesus? Can you see why the disciples might have been confused? This is the Christ this is the Messiah. This is the beloved Son of God. They heard the Father declare it upon the mountain. And yet here God is handing over his Son. In the very next chapter of Mark's gospel, in chapter 10, Jesus is going to make the very same affirmation he makes here. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And here's his very next statement, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, how? To give his life as a ransom for many. So how did Jesus become the servant of all? By suffering and dying at the hands of wicked men, taking upon himself the very wrath of God that was deserved by sinners. Why? Why? So that sinners like you and me, might be freely forgiven and be set free from condemnation. He bore in his own body the judgment of God's people on the cross. 
And having humbled himself in that way, we read it earlier in Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him, raising him from the dead, giving him the name that is above every name so that everyone may confess Jesus Christ is Lord. The last shall be first. This is greatness in the eyes of God. Jesus made himself the willing servant of all, the servant of those in terrible need, the servant even of his own enemies. Why? So that salvation might be freely offered to anyone who will repent of sin and trust in Christ for that salvation that he has provided. And you need to hear this as we talk about Christian service this morning. That is where all genuine Christian service begins. We must humble ourselves and recognize we need the service of Christ for us. And you must receive that service that he has provided to you in faith. And that's then where you can bear fruit and go and serve even as he has served you. But you've got to start with what Christ has done for you. And, and Mark tells us in verse 32, the disciples, they, they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. They just were not able yet to grasp how does the death of the Messiah fit into God's plan of salvation. They would get it eventually by the Spirit, but they don't get it yet. And I think as we continue in our text, it also becomes clear they really didn't understand this this ministry of humble service that then Christ also was calling them to live as his followers. And that's our second point this morning, that we've seen the service of Christ himself, which he has done for us. Now let's look at the service of Christ's disciples, verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, let's just say this was not the disciples' best moment. The disciples had a variety of these types of moments in Jesus' ministry. It's hard to know which was the worst, but this has got to be up there somewhere. Not not only because of the content, but because of the timing. Here Jesus is trying to help them understand the terrible suffering and death that he's going to face in loving service for them. And as they journey on, how do they respond? With utter self-interest, self-focus. They turn inward. They're trying to measure themselves against one another to see who was the greatest of Jesus' disciples. And Jesus, the, the great shepherd, right, who knows their hearts, he so gently reveals this to them, right, their foolishness. What were you discussing on the way? <laughs> you know, I think many parents have had this experience where you, you hear your kids arguing in the next room and you, you enter into the room, you're like, what are you guys talking about? Everything goes really quiet. They don't want to say because they know whatever it was, they shouldn't have been arguing about it. The disciples, I think that's their response. They're convicted. I think they're ashamed. And we read this and we think, have they heard nothing that Jesus has said? Have they forgotten whose company they're in? They have seen unimaginable displays of Jesus' power, of Jesus' authority, of Jesus' glory, even visibly for some of them, and they want to argue about which one of them is the greatest? And we're tempted to just like shake our heads in disbelief, but don't we do the same thing? Pride And the love of personal distinction and the praise of men, the love of the praise of men is deeply bound up in our hearts. 
We want to be, as the disciples did, distinguished as greater than those around us. We're hardwired for this. We want to compare ourselves to others. We delight to see ourselves distinguished and recognized in some way over and above and against other people. And when we become focused on ourselves in that game of comparison, what happens? It's amazing how quickly that takes our eyes off of Jesus. And it kills the freedom and the impetus to serve and to consider the good of those around us and to pursue that rather than pursue our own glory. And this type of thing, I mean, it's insidious. It can creep into every area of our lives. Whatever vocation you may be in, business, medicine, the trades, ministry, there is a danger, right, of being driven by selfish gain, self-promotion, personal glory. We, we can try to maximize our skills and our abilities and our effectiveness, our, our breadth of influence, not so that more people are going to be better served, but so that people will recognize our superiority over others, so that we will achieve maximum earthly status and gain, and, and we can start to calculate everything according to that goal. As a mother, you may long to be recognized and distinguished for the way that you care for your children in your home. And so, instead of looking to be an encouragement to other moms, pointing them to the grace and the sufficiency of Jesus so you can humbly band together in the challenges of motherhood, instead you feel threatened by other moms. You want to distinguish yourself from them and separate yourself from them. It's the pride of distinguishing yourself. I mean, you, you can run with this into every category, right? Academics, sports, physical beauty, social popularity. We seek to rise above others in our efforts to achieve greatness and worldly recognition, thinking it's going to bring us joy. And the irony is as we become more consumed with ourselves, we cut ourselves off from true joy and we cut ourselves off from true honor in the sight of God. It's just clear. The disciples were operating here with the world's definition of greatness. The world identifies greatness with self-distinction, with self-glorification. If someone can distinguish themselves above others in some way in the world's eyes, that is greatness. And when you pursue that type of greatness, you know what happens? People become a means in your life to achieve that end. Relationships, people, you start to evaluate them from the perspective of what they can contribute to your advantage, to your promotion. And if they need to be used or stepped on in the process, so be it. But what does Jesus do? Jesus calls his disciples to a better way. He calls them to a life of service, lovingly, sacrificially seeking the genuine good of other people, which Jesus says is truly great and truly honorable. Look at verse 35. And he sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Here's, I think, really something really important to notice here. Jesus does not remove the legitimacy of greatness and honor. He doesn't take that category away. He transforms the, its nature and what it is. Jesus doesn't say... If you want to be last, then be last. That's not what he says. He says, if you want to be first, then be last. That's really important. 
Jesus is not calling us to service and self-denial purely for self-denial's sake. Just as D- Jesus did not go to the cross because he just loved to suffer. That's not why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. Joy that was multiplied in the glorious provision of salvation for countless people and that was then experienced in the exaltation of his name by the Father for the loving service that he had provided. And now Jesus calls us to follow him in that service. Self-denial that genuinely loves and serves others is truly honorable in God's sight and it will receive a great reward which is going to be experienced in the super abundant provision and fellowship and joy of Christ himself and is then multiplied in the joy and the blessing of others in his name. We, we begin to taste that. Even in this life as we serve others, we will taste it in full when Jesus comes back. So I just want you to hear this. Jesus wants you to be great. He just doesn't want you to be great in the way the world defines greatness. I think it's also important to say here, Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have a position of authority. If that were true, every parent would have to abdicate their role immediately. Jesus is not saying that kids should run the household and parents should just do whatever they say. Sorry, kids. But actually, that would not serve you, which proves the point. Jesus is not saying, don't ever take a position of authority. He's not saying you shouldn't hold a government office or you shouldn't be a police officer. He's not saying it's wrong to make a lot of money or build a successful business. He's not saying you should not be excellent in your craft. He's not saying you shouldn't be a teacher or a pastor. But what he says here does dramatically transform the purpose for which you do all of those things. We are not to pursue those things for selfish gain, for worldly distinction, but for the genuine good of others as we humbly and sacrificially serve them with whatever position, whatever resources, whatever abilities, whatever time, whatever energy God has given us. We leverage that for the good of other people. And that is the greatness of service to which Jesus calls every one of his disciples. And I think at this point, it's it's very important to say, although Jesus' words certainly do not forbid you from serving others from a position that that may have significant earthly influence or authority or resources, you also need to know Jesus' words make clear that often what God regards as truly great and honorable will not be recognized by the world as truly great and honorable. You need to know that. And I think that's where Jesus goes in his next demonstration. And that, that brings us to our last And our third point this morning, the service of those who are weak. So we've seen the service of Christ himself, right? Suffering and dying for our salvation. The service of Christ's disciples in terms of the, the life that Christ calls us to live as his followers. Sacrificially giving of ourselves in order to serve others. And, and I think this now, it's, it's a further explanation of that call for you to serve as his disciples. But I think what Jesus does here, he puts a finer point on it as he makes really clear that our service should have a particular orientation, a a particular inclination and burden, especially directed towards those who are weak. Look at verse 36. And he took a child... (laughs) 
and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. There are other places in Scripture where Jesus teaches that we ourselves need to become like children in order to enter his kingdom. And that captures a very important truth that in the most significant ways, we're all weak. Be very clear about that. We are all among the weak. None of us is truly strong in the sense of having the, the power or the righteousness or the wisdom for us to enter the kingdom of God. We are all dependent fully upon the mercy of Christ for that. But I don't think that's the precise point that Jesus is making here. Here, Jesus brings this child forward as an example of someone who, from an earthly perspective, really is weaker, more vulnerable, more dependent, having greater need. I think this child represents people who, who aren't going to have a lot to offer you in terms of social benefit, in terms of reputation, in terms of material gain, even in terms of relational benefit. But Jesus says when you receive and welcome and serve such people for his sake, right? He says, in my name you receive them. Jesus regards that as service to him. <laughs> and, and when you serve him, you serve the Father who sent him. So, so it may seem like you're serving this lowly person, but in reality, in that service, you're serving the king of kings. And that king has a particular concern and care for those who are weak, those who are vulnerable, those who are in need, right? Time and time again, the scriptures speak of, speak of what? God's concern for the widow, God's concern for the orphan, God's con concern for the refugee, God's concern for the lame, God's concern for the outcast, the neglected. Jesus speaks in Matthew 25 of the hungry, the thirsty, the lonely, the sick, the imprisoned from among his people. And he says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And that service, it, it's not going to look the same in every person's life. There are countless opportunities, countless ways that this can be lived out. But Jesus makes clear there should be in each one of us as his disciples a particular inclination, a particular burden to serve and to care for those who are weaker in the world. And I think this just very basic starts with regarding the children that God gives us in our own families, not as burdens or obstacles to something greater, but as an opportunity, as gifts to be served and to love, to be loved and to cared for in his name. Do you recognize your children are a gift in that regard? For some, this could look like serving as foster parents, adopting a child, coming alongside others who do. We have an adoption fund here at Clifton that's been so wonderfully supplied by this church and so wonderfully used by families in this church. We're so grateful for that. This might mean bringing an elderly parent or a relative to live with you in their home, in your home. This could mean going out of your way. Listen, students, this could mean going out of your way to be kind to someone at school who's lonely, who struggles to connect socially. You know what? That's socially risky, and it is so honoring to Jesus. This may mean advocating for legal protection for the unborn or, or volunteering locally with an a crisis pregnancy center like Beside You for Life here in Louisville, supporting them 
in their ministry. This could be seeking to provide gospel hope and help to the homeless. We have a wonderful ministry here in in Louisville called Recenter Ministries. We support as a church, and, and you could come alongside them. Coming alongside a refugee, again, another wonderful ministry here in Louisville, Refuge International, trying to help those who've been displaced from their country. That is a weak situation to be in, a very difficult situation to be in, wonderful opportunity for the gospel. This could be as simple as offering to provide a ride to church for someone who can't drive themselves, picking them up for a doctor's appointment. Listen, Ethan Holstein, our deacon of special needs here at Clifton, he'll send out opportunities. I hope you see those as great opportunities for greatness in the eyes of the Lord. This could be visiting and befriending one of our homebound members of Clifton who isn't able to come to church and going to them and providing regular fellowship or or even just a neighbor around you who lives alone and is in need of the love of Christ to befriend them and make the gospel known to them. This could be giving of your time to meet with someone who's struggling spiritually We all go through those situations, but you know the situations where you have a conversation, you think, if I enter in here, this is going to be a bigger commitment. And the Lord is so honored when you don't back away, but you enter in relationally to provide encouragement, prayer, discipleship for somebody who's weak, struggling spiritually. I mean, it's just, we, we could go on and on, that the opportunities for greatness are endless. I do just have to add here that often when we seek to give ourselves to those who are weaker, and we do that with a sincere intention to serve them and to bless them, don't we often find that we ourselves are blessed and enriched by them in ways that we never anticipated. They help us too in the Lord's wisdom in ways that we weren't even planning. That doesn't mean it's always easy. And this type of service, it largely goes unnoticed by the world. It's not typically headline grabbing. It is often filled with rather common mundane tasks. It can be repetitive. It can be tiring and difficult. As I said earlier, it can be risky socially. It can be challenging relationally. And for the amount of time and energy that you give to that kind of service, the visible payoff can seem small. The world's going to look at that service And they're not going to be impressed. They're not going to see greatness. In fact, they may label it as foolishness. But here Jesus says, if that's what the world says, they are working with the wrong definition of greatness. And they are failing to believe Christ's promise to those who follow him on that path of sacrificial service. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And when you give yourself in sacrificial service to others in Jesus' name, even if it's invisible to the world, even if it's invisible to many of the members of your own church, you know what? Jesus sees it. The Father sees it. They recognize it as as glorious service to them, and they mark it as such. They regard it as truly honorable, truly great, and worthy of great reward. And more than that, they promise it will be rewarded one day. And the one who makes him last will be first. So brothers and sisters, as disciples 
of Jesus. May we seek greatness, but may we seek it according to Christ's word and according to his promise. Let's pray. So, Lord, again, that's what we pray for even now. We pray that you would help us to realign our perspective on greatness with your word, your true and trustworthy word this morning. And may we give ourselves fully to service in your name, trusting you for your promise that you see it. You see it as honorable and great and worthy of great reward. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen.